So Noreen and I were called into the local police station. We thought we were going to pick up our long-term residence permits. And when we got there, we were shocked when they told us, we're going to deport you, we're arresting you, and holding you for deportation. Eventually, they did release Noreen, and then they uh, moved me around for, to different places, put me into prison, uh, and kept me for two years. The, at the beginning, I was crying because I didn't want to be deported. I thought, we've been working here for so long, 23 years, and uh, God had spoken to us to prepare for harvest. And I thought, this, this isn't possible. You're deporting us. We're supposed to be here. And then after a few days, I was crying because they wouldn't deport me. <laughs> uh, so we came to see over time that actually that was part of, uh, it was an assignment for me uh, to be in prison because so many people began to pray around the world. And God had told us to prepare for harvest. And actually, this was one of the best ways that I could serve that preparation. Uh, I was doing nothing, just sitting in prison trying to hold on. And yet people were praying all over the world. And that prayer was pouring into Turkey. And when you say the word harvest for some of those that are watching that are not maybe familiar with that term, that means you're wanting people to come into to relationship with Jesus. Now, with Noreen, uh, she is also in prison, taken in. Tell me about how it was when she was released. And I, I guess in a way it was bittersweet because yes, your wife is, you know, getting to be released, but now you're by yourself. Yes, I was very glad that she could get out. Uh, and, and then I also knew that someone would be fighting for me. Uh, up until then, we weren't sure that anyone even knew where we were. Uh, but it, I was also very afraid. Uh, I had told her just the day before, I said, you know what I'm really afraid of is it, is it we'll be separated. And I'll be completely alone and I won't know what's happening to you. And then wh what I was afraid of actually did happen. We were separated and then I had to uh, steal myself just to become, uh, to being all alone. And after that, they put me into another detention center and I was in solitary confinement for 50 days and that was oh. very difficult. And even more difficult, I think, in a sense, is when you were moved into a prison cell that was incredibly overcrowded with terrible conditions. So tell me a little bit about what it was like living in prison. So they put me in a cell uh, for eight people, but we had over 20 people there. And one of the very difficult things was the isolation. So I was isolated by culture and life experience and language, but especially isolated uh, by faith because I was the only Christian and all the other people I was with were very strong Muslims. So it was like a 24-7 uh, house of prayer, but a Muslim house of prayer. So it was very intense. We never left the cell. It was 24-7 in that room. With, with a lot of people crammed in. And I, I really broke uh, the, the isolation, being the only believer throughout my two years in prison, the only believer I had any contact with was with Noreen on visits uh, that we were allowed. And uh, that isolation and the fear, not knowing what was going to happen to me, uh, it, I, I broke down and I became suicidal over time. What did they say to you in terms of why you were being held? Because I know that's a question people say, well, this guy is a missionary. Is that your missionary activities or what were they saying to you? They, they knew all that we were doing because we did it openly for 23 years. We didn't hide what we did and it was not illegal. Uh, but they accused me of many different things. Uh, they knew that I was innocent. So this was coming from the very top of the government. and. I think they arrested me to intimidate other people, to intimidate other missionaries, to intimidate local Christians, uh, Turks. Uh, and then it became something political over time where they wanted to use me to gain concessions from the US. Uh, so the reasons they gave were not really the reasons they were holding me, but they said that I was a terrorist, that I was a military spy, that I had helped to plan and orchestrate an attempted coup. They were all lies, but they were used as propaganda to paint Christians as being uh, traitors and haters of Turks, which is not at all the case. We don't hate Turks, we love Turks. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Such a difficult time for you in prison. You mentioned you became suicidal. Just before Christmas, you're out in the prison yard, you're looking at the clothesline. Tell me about that moment. Well, what took me there was a real sense of despair, uh, isolation, and, and feeling abandoned by God. He never abandoned me, I wanna stress that, but I felt that way. and. I had pursued God's presence for years before. And when I went into prison, I expected that I would have this sense of strength, a sense of joy, even though it would be difficult that I'd uh, have a sense of grace and certainly God's presence. And what really surprised me is when that was removed. So for the two years in prison, I did not 
have a sense of God's presence, and I, I felt abandoned. And so I was very confused. And I had many questions. I had a lot of doubts. And this is something that, especially the first year, I felt that I was very broken. And in the second year, there was more of a, a rebuilding that took place. How did you rebuild, Andrew? Um, and, and I think, you know, again, I've met so many that have had these prison experiences, and everybody is different. You know, some will say, well, I just felt this incredible peace and joy. Others, you share, and I think that has been more, you know, the ones that I've heard, that desperation, this anxiety, depression. So how did you start to get out of it, and what, what did you feel the Lord was doing in that? So I, I hit a number of very low points, and I came to... Basically, I came to a point where I said, I need to, there's very little I can do to fight for my freedom, but I can fight for my relationship with God, and I have to because it's just being suffocated. And so it was a decision of the will. It wasn't from my emotions. I felt beaten down and, and very low, just very weak the whole time. But it was a decision, I'm going to turn toward God. I will keep my eyes focused on Him. And I said, whatever you do, God, whatever you do or don't do, I will follow you. Whether you speak to me or not, I will follow you. Whether uh, you give me your presence or not, I will follow you. Whether you release me or not, I will follow you. And after that, I began a series of disciplines and of steps where, where I focused myself on God. And one of the important things, I, I had all of these doubts and questions. Uh, and I came to see that actually God had questions for me. And many, many believers go into a, a valley of testing. And I, I was in a valley of testing and I thought so many Christians are, the valley of testing is full of dry bones. It's full of the skeletons of people who didn't survive. But you don't usually know you're in that period or do well, you? Well, I knew that I was in yeah. there. Absolutely. Yeah. And but I mean, in the sense that God was testing you in it, did you sense that or are you just trying to survive? I don't say that God causes all, all our problems, but in the midst of those, he will test us. And I was in the midst of a very uh, intense testing. And I thought, I want to survive this. I'm not saying people, you know, when I say skeletons and dry bones of believers, they, I'm not talking about going to heaven. You know, they can go to heaven, but I'm talking about relationship with God. Mm. And people lose that friendship with God. And I thought, I'm on the verge of, of that. And so I'm going to fight for my faith. And I realized that I had questions for God, but he had questions for me. So Andrew, are you going to be faithful when you don't feel my presence? Will you wow. continue to love me even if you feel abandoned? So I was being tested. And, and I determined that I wanted to come out of that test victorious and be faithful to God, and so I pressed in. You know, you uh, actually went all the way to the point where you started thinking that you'd be more impactful for God and His work if you stayed in prison. So that's like a huge arc from, you know, from where you were thinking, I'd be better if I committed suicide. I didn't want to be in prison, but I came to think, <laughs> oh no, I see all these people praying for me, and maybe I'm more valuable to God in prison than out, so He may keep me in here so more people will pray. But what I did come to was, uh, there was a battle to say, your will be done and not mine. And if your purposes are best served by my being in prison, I don't want to be here. I want to be with my family. And the, Turks, the Turkish government had said they wanted three life sentences for me. So I thought I might spend the rest of my life there. I said, I don't want to be here. But if my being here will serve your purposes, then I want to serve your purposes and not mine. Wow. Did you know, Andrew, that people were praying for you? And did you feel that? I, I knew it because this is what Noreen would tell me. We were allowed one visit a week and uh, through you know, reinforced glass and on, on phones. And I would ask every week, are people praying for me? I had such a, a hunger, a, a need to know that, that believers were standing with me. And she would say, yes, and it's actually growing. And this was an encouragement. But there was no guarantee that I would get out. And there's no, there's no verse in the Bible that says Andrew will be released from prison. So it was an encouragement. I could see that God was working. I know that there was a lot of grace, but it was an unfelt grace. So I didn't feel, oh, all these prayers are pouring in. I have strength this morning. I know objectively that people are standing with me in prayer. This is an encouragement, but I still feel weak. So just after two years, you get on a plane and then you come down those steps and you see your wife and your kids Tell me about that moment and what you were feeling. It was uh, an, a, a roller coaster that day because I was taken to my fourth trial session and I was actually convicted uh, of being a terrorist. And so they convict me, they sentence me to prison, 
And there'd been all this pressure for me to be released. And I thought, well, none of it worked. Now I'm going back to prison. So they convict me, they sentence me, and then suddenly they say, we're releasing you while you appeal the sentence. And then there's a rush to get me to the airport onto an Air Force plane and back to the state. So we went from convicted in a, a, in a court to 24 hours later being in the White House. Tell me about that. I mean, here's a guy that thinks maybe you're going to spend the rest of your life in prison and whatever, God, you're going to do what you're going to do. And then you're in the White House. I mean, that, I, I can't even get my brain around that. It was a real whirlwind and it felt very surreal to me. It felt to me like it was happening to somebody else. Just the, if you can imagine the, the roller coaster of emotions from conviction, think I'm going back to prison, to suddenly within a day seeing my children and being free again. It was uh, only God. Only God. <laughs> yeah. For someone watching right now who's going through a trial, who may be experiencing some of the same emotions you felt, what advice would you have for them? You have a choice, no matter how difficult your situation is. You have a choice to turn toward God or away from him. And it was my turning toward him and determining that I was going to keep looking at him that invited him into my situation and I began to cooperate with grace. So everyone can turn to him.